Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, it's great to be back and rolling, uh, starting official practice today. I think it's been a really good um, off season, fall, winter break. Uh, our players have done some great things uh, preparing, and uh, hopefully, you will see the fruits of their labor as we get back on the field and some transformation um, in them as individual players, us as a team, and, and frankly, as a program. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to point out. Uh, when you have this many eyes on you that may fly under the radar. Um, we had 25 players uh, get a GPA better than 3.0 3 uh, in the fall. And in recent memory, the records went back 20 years. Uh, we had the highest team GPA uh, for LSU baseball over that, that time frame. So it's a really good job uh, by the players, you know, being accountable to that, which is really important. I definitely think there's some translation off the field and on the field in that regard. Great job by our academic support and uh, something that I think should be highlighted. Uh, there's a couple other ways I, th I think we've been able to elevate what we're doing. Uh, I've had some really good um, off the field or non-coaching staff uh, additions with uh, Josh Walker, new trainer, uh, came to us from Kentucky, has done a great job, uh, great person, hard worker, very available, um, and in baseball, uh, keeping your team healthy is, is is important and has built a really good rapport with the players. And then uh, a very significant add with Derek Groomer, our new strength coach. I think our, our players would speak to uh, speak to that, and I think you can kind of see it in the transformation of their bodies um, and how they move and how they work is is exceptional. Um, so really happy with how we added uh, there. Uh, really like uh, where we're at right now as a, as a program, and and you're building two things at once uh, from the head coach chair. You're building the team, which is the 2023 team, which we'll talk a lot about today, and then uh, a program. And uh, piece by piece, we're trying to put this thing uh, together to uh, reach the ceiling. And uh, we all know what LSU baseball's ceiling can be. I mean, that's why we have a audience like we do uh, today. But a, a couple elements of that. I think what makes this a great place to be uh, is, is the past. And just last night, uh, myself, Coach Jordan, and Josh Simpson, our Director of Operations, uh, we spent some time with uh, several LSU baseball alums and, and Coach Burtman, and just what an environment to be in. You know, those guys are so interested in what we're doing, and they're so behind us. I mean, it makes you feel like you're just, you're just being lifted up. And then the old war stories with, with Coach Burtman and some of those players and the impersonations uh, come out was, was really, you couldn't walk out of there and feel more supportive of, supported by the past. You know, I would obviously extend that as well uh, to Coach Mary's group, particularly the current Major League superstars, you know, that have come from here. Um, and, you know, whether it was Aaron and Austin Nola Spending time with them last week at their uh, charity event. Uh, Kevin Gosman's out here preparing for spring training. Um, man, I mean, it's just, it's awesome. You know, every, Alex Bregman here at the first pitch uh, banquet last Sunday night with over a thousand people and taking his time uh, to fly over here and, and spend time. And he sat in on our team meeting uh, on Monday. And um, just, just awesome, awesome to be connected to, to that. And then uh, with the team, um, specifically uh, made a lot of uh, changes on the coaching staff, you know, because other people got promoted to other positions at other schools, which is great for them, but uh, feel great about how that is lining up. It's more than just smart baseball minds. It's smart baseball minds with really high character that are super, super invested in what we're trying to, to build here. And, and that's frankly develop the players and the team to be the best that that they can be. I'll just, I'll give you an example, and this is an everyday occurrence as I'm walking down the hallway and there's four or five of them in Josh Simpson's office, which is the director of ops office, which is the smallest one in the building. And Coach Wanaka is writing on the board. Wes is talking. You know, Josh is over here saying something. And um, every word that I heard from that conversation has to do with building us towards success. So I think that uh, that's really positive and uh, feel great about it and you know our players and players parents and people interested in the program should know that they have really high level people and and baseball coaches you know that are that are operating here right now which is is essential and and required to do the things that we want to do 
um, you know, about moving forward, um, you know, we gave 2022 everything we had. I'm incredibly proud uh, of that team and that group of players and, and the things that they accomplished. Um, I didn't even know this, but I um, heard it the other night at the, the banquet. I think Bill had mentioned it, that it was the first time being in the top four in the SEC in, in the past six years or five years, I believe. Um, and going through that schedule and, and the road games that we've played and, and were successful in, uh, really proud of those guys. You know, obviously, we know where we all want to end up and be and, and fell a little short of that. But uh, it was a lot more than just results last year. It was about uh, building a solid foundation. And um, I think we accomplished a lot of things in that regard that you'll see this team really, really benefit from. And, you know, it's been however long we got here, 18 months, 19 months, whatever it is now. You know, you kind of, at least I did, always had an eye on, on 2023 and just trying to elevate everything we're doing from a, obviously a recruiting and a talent standpoint, from a development standpoint, from a staff standpoint. And, you know, want to give a tip of the cap to our administration. You know, Scott Woodward, Dan Gaston, um, Stephanie Rimp moved on uh, to the University of Nevada, uh, Kelly Zinn, like we couldn't be more supported. And that's, that's such a big deal when everyone is focused on the same goals and then understands there's things you have to do to achieve those and put those pieces in place. And I think we're in a good spot um, with that. Uh, lastly, you know, before I open it up to questions, just kind of how this goes from here is uh, we play in 21 days, I believe, uh, three weeks. Uh, we'll have 18 training sessions or practices over the next 21 days with three days off. We'll scrimmage 11 or 12 times. Uh, most of those will be open. Some of them will be a little smaller and in a practice setting, uh, which we won't open up, but that's no different than, than what we did last year. But that'll kind of give you the layout. Um, you know, the weekends will be uh, going as, as we build pitchers pitch counts up, and that's when the majority of that will be done. Uh, we may adjust some of that uh, due to weather if need be, but it's beautiful uh, out here today. So we're looking forward uh, to getting out here and, and getting going. Coach, two questions. One, when you sent them out, when you sent them home for the fall, you, there were specific things you wanted them to get better on and improve upon. What have you seen coming back on if they've been able to do that? And then the second question is, go into a little detail with Wes in terms of when you talk to players, you talk to recruits, his, he's all about the details. And, you know, I, he changes one inch of my pitch grip, it changes this for the better. Like, just talk about what Wes brings to this pitching staff. Yeah, um, I'll go back to the, the first part of that. And looking out, like, you, expectations uh, for us are, are real simple. It's maximum effort towards preparation and towards executing what the game requires for the team to be successful. You, the player can't do that if they don't know what to do. And I think um, most coaches, and this is a very general statement across sports, most people know what to do. But the key is the how to do it for the player. And we had a great fall practice session where I think we scrimmaged or played the two fall games. We had 23 times that we were able to play in that, that fall segment. And so the players got exposed. And so what you do with that is you take where they are, you take where you want them to get to and go, and then the middle part of that's important, the how to do it. So they need to know what to do, and then you have to lay out a plan for how they do that. And then a lot of that is self-ownership. You know, I, not that I was counting, but we didn't get to be with them for 53 straight days, you know, from November 20th until January 15th. And so the, the ownership of them taking their strength and conditioning, you know, their throwing programs as, as pitchers to be healthy, uh, the developmental work of, of where they need to get to was exceptional. I mean, there, there's a lot of guys that barely went home for Christmas. And, um, and that tells you, the maturity of that and uh, are operating in a way that's very professional, a very professional manner. And sometimes guys have to mature into that. And then once they get a taste of what this looks like and what it requires to perform at the level they need to perform, then sometimes they make the jump. But when I talk about, you know, building off of a foundation, you know, and building this, this program where not just working on your own, but working on your own properly and on the right things, can really elevate you as a player. I've seen a lot of that, you know, so that's one way that you could say last year really impacted this year. And then having the right guys on the bus is, is something that I talk about 
a lot, and we have that. You know, with the, the guys that were on last year's team that are still here, they've set a really good example for that. And so that's how that process works a little bit. In regards to Wes, he is a terrific coach, as good as there is at a specific skill set and position in, in any sport. And I think some insight into that is sometimes you get labeled as a um, analytics or statistics or those types of things. Guy, yeah, well, it starts there. I mean, then being unbelievable at the science of how the body moves. And, and it was really the, like the tip of the sword, cutting edge of that several years ago. And so really has transformed the way pitching happens. So that's just part of it though. But then as you said, David, to look at you know, the, the track man or the, the data from the force plate and then be able to go, this is what it says, this is what it means, this is what I need you to do and get execution, um, that's, it's phenomenal. And that's something that I'm really excited about. I mentioned that uh, event we went to or was dinner at, at, a, at a house last night. Um, somebody mentioned, you know, coming to one of the fall games and just how complete and professional and athletic everybody's delivery looked. And that's kind of a byproduct of that work. And then it just, it doesn't stop there. You go into game prep and those types of things, which is really exciting. You know, I'm obviously into that. I mean, just getting that to a whole new level. Uh, the benefit is, is the pitchers and, and the pitchers success is the team's success as we know. So um, he's as impressive as, as advertised. Hey, Coach, um, just you've talked a lot you know, this offseason about how this team's going to need to be selfless because of how deep this, this group is. Um, just wonder if you could touch on a couple of the position battles that are going to be going on uh, over the next three weeks, and then just how much do you see that carrying into the season as well? Yeah, um, relative to the, the first part of that question of being selfless, it'll be essential. You know, and, and I really, no different than the player development, that what do we need to do to achieve? that has to be laid out for them. And it's very clear, you know, our, our roadmap is very clear of the things that we need to do. And that is a big part of the blueprint for 2023. Now, what's great about it, and, and again, a, a, a nod to the past, so to speak, if, you know, LSU has played baseball for a long time and six national championships is a lot compared to everywhere else. You look at those teams and there were things that those teams exhibited that we can point to as the best examples. Um, you know, and the last one in, in 2009, you're looking at Austin Nola, major league player, pretty good one. You know, Mikey Montuk was a major league player. As freshmen, those guys didn't start out the year as everyday players, but they stayed engaged. They kept working. Uh, they had a role at the time, because I think both were terrific defenders at shortstop in the outfield, got some experience, and then we're ready to ready to go. If they would have just packed it in, not a very good example, and uh, wouldn't have been ready. And 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 they made significant contributions at the back half of that schedule and in the postseason. So those guys know who those two are. So it's like if they did that, and this is what you want to try to accomplish, something like that, we have to emulate that. And then there's the older player, you know, Leon Landry, who was a good player here. Like I certainly remember his name, uh, who I think came out of the lineup. You know what I mean? And handled that in a really good way. And then there's this big image of the dog pile of that team. I mean, Leon Landry's like sky high flying in there. Like that dude looks like he's doing okay, <laughs> like having fun. Um, you know, Warren Morris is the best example of it. As a freshman on the 1993 national championship team, he redshirted. I mean, he didn't play. <laughs> so think about the landscape of college baseball history. If he would have just didn't handle that the right way. And then the most iconic play in the history of college baseball is the walk-off home run in 1996, another national championship. Kurt Ainsworth, you know, I mean, went from in five years, red shirt on a national championship team, two years later, he's a first round pick and dominant starting pitcher here. And then two years later, he's in pitching, or at least in the Major League World Series, like in five years. And so, um, you know, I think helping the players understand what being selfless looks like. You know, relative to position battles, a lot to sort out, you know. And, um, you know, one of our foundational pieces of the program is, is competing. And that's an everyday thing. And that's another part of it, of, of every day has value. So um, happy to answer some specific questions about it. But there's a lot to be determined 
because there's a lot of guys that can make a positive contribution. Um, you know, I mean, Dylan Cruz is going to play. You know, I mean, it's not hard to figure out. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know, and there's other guys that I feel that way about on this team right now, both on the pitching side of it and the position player side of it. Um, so I'm excited for you guys to see that evolve. You know, and it's not just three weeks of opening day. Um, you know, I've had teams that made it to Omaha that at the beginning of the year, like we were having a practice for only part of the guys on Monday that didn't play very much opening weekend and they line up in the College World Series and they're in the starting lineup. And when you have talented teams, sometimes it takes time for that to sort out. And, you know, as you guys probably saw, we're not just going to do everything conventionally and buy the book last year. And when you have a talented roster, it can open you up to more possibilities and use guys uh, in certain ways. And so, you know, there's four to five positions like that. And there's certainly some rotation bullpen where that um, that's going to show. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for it to, to take shape. Your players reported back early to work with the new strength coach, Derek Groomer. Can you elaborate on how you got him here and who he is and what he brings to this program? Yeah, uh, it, was a, it was like a <laughs> three and a half month process. And I want to say Travis Roy worked extremely hard here last year and was incredibly bought into the success of LSU and bought into our, our coaching staff. And, you know, in September came to me and said, hey, I think I'm going to take my life in a little different direction for the benefit of his family, which is a great decision for him. And then uh, we didn't really rush into it. Um, you know, it was kind of like three and a half months or three months of like, really investigating, a lot of names, a lot of uh, recommendations from people. And, you know, anytime we hire, you got to get one or of, of two things right. You got to get the person that's the best at what they do, or you got to get somebody that has a burning desire to be the best at what they do and that have been around people that have been highly successful at the job you need them to do. So, um, you know, he spent some time at TCU and their strength and conditioning relative to baseball is elite. Um, and then he spent some time at Arkansas, and their guy just got uh, promoted to the Chicago Cubs, uh, big league strength coach. So you're looking at a guy that's highly motivated, incredibly intelligent, that has spent time with two of the best strength coaches in college baseball. Well, then it becomes the, the specific nature of what he's doing and how the body needs to move building strength, building mobility, uh, fast twitch, recovery, uh, testing, you know what I mean, or assessments as we call them, and picking the part, the weakness, and um, attacking it. And I, I literally, I mean, he was here at the end of the fall. There's players on our team, like within two weeks' time, just doing the right thing, they looked different. It was, it was remarkable. You know, um, you know, I think like a Josh Stevenson, you know, tall, guy a chance to add muscle it was like he was standing up straighter had better posture like was moving better and um, you know when they returned just evaluating how they're moving both throwing the baseball and, and swinging the bat you could see kind of that we're on the right track with that um, you know coming across him uh, like I said recommendations I think we did 12 zoom interviews um, which may seem like a lot but that tells you the importance of that position and, and what we need. And, and I thought he was far and away the best guy. Hey, Coach. Uh, you mentioned earlier about some of the force plate stuff and, and the track man stuff and the way Coach Johnson uses all that. Um, has he sort of changed the way that you sort of look at that stuff? And are you guys just going to maybe, I don't say emphasize, emphasize it more, but maybe utilize it more this season? Everything, everything has its place. And, you know, you can't, like, necessarily develop when you're trying to get the guy to compete and you got to be careful of the compete line when you're trying to t teach and develop skill and that's what like we want to be good at all of it and, and have this complete uh, template for the player to be able to excel and he's elite at taking that knowing what it means and translating it to the pitcher as far as my buy-in I just I want to hire people that are, like I said, the best at what they do. And, and I really would put him there, you know, not just in a college baseball setting, but in a baseball period setting. And, um, you know, we almost made it happen last year. Uh, everything happens in, in the right time. And 
certainly excited to watch both the development and then the help and game execution and then with talent because that's the other part of it that's uh, significantly improved in my opinion. So you put all those things together, excited about what I think this pitching staff can do. Coach, last year when last year's first year we talked about expectations and of course building camaraderie, but now with the first year under you and these guys know your expectation and what areas did you raise the bar? <sighs> Another really good question. I think uh, that's a daily thing. Um, you know, I think it was very foundational of like what to expect, um, being a very fundamentally sound team, and then like, okay, what does that mean? And then the discipline it takes to actually do that. Um, I feel better about that. Uh, the competitive level, valuing winning, um, you know, having this idea that teams can prepare for what we do, how we pitch, how we hit, but they can't prepare for the competitive nature of the group. And I think at times you saw a lot of that. I think not just the roster will elevate that, but the opportunity for those players to really understand what that means. You know, competing on the road in the SEC with, you know, some of the top programs in the country, you know, being in the NCAA tournament, you know, in a one run game that's going to advance you to a super regional or not, um, they have a little better idea of, I think, what that means. And then, you know, a character piece where it's just about, the player's ability to make good decisions on and off the field. Now what we have is you have a group of returning players that were chosen to return here, that have full understanding of what that looks like, that can model that, that younger players can emulate. Then you have players that were freshmen last year that this is all that they know. You know, how we run September, how we run fall practice, what the expectations are in December, leading into the season, and then competing. And then it's the same thing now with the freshman group or new players that have been brought in. So you find yourself working instead of like explaining a lot. And I think that will really benefit the productivity of what we're able to get done. Uh, how do you feel about your middle infield, specifically second base? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think in the middle infield, uh, really excited about Jordan Thompson's uh, development. Uh, he's fully healthy. Um, had a knee procedure literally like three weeks before opening night last year. And, um, you know, we really had to nurse that. Um, you know, obviously struggled early in the season. Very proud of him. If you look at the back, we'll just call it 20, 25 games of the schedule, he performed at a high level, um, performed terrific in the fall. Like he is clearly the shortstop right now. I, I would speak of Jordan in the way that I would speak of Dylan in terms of where he stands on the team right now. I think second base uh, is exciting. Uh, it allows us some flexibility to do different things. And I think we have four players that can all make a positive contribution and they're all a little bit different um, in no order um, at all. Uh, we added Ben Napolt from Virginia Commonwealth. He's a left-handed hitter, uh, really solid player. He's a good player for this team. When you talk about some of those, Dylan Cruz, Tommy White, Trey Morgan, really fits in terms of mature at bats control in the baseball. Uh, Gavin Guidry, certainly a, a talent. And um, a really good day yesterday. We played a small three inning scrimmage yesterday. It's great to see um, some of the physical talent translate into usable skill to help the team win, just in terms of handling the ball and routine plays, those types of things. Um, Jack Merrifield, uh, who was a, a contributor to us earlier in the season last year, probably led the team in hitting in the fall and um, he's a great example of, of, of the player you need in, in the program to not just push guys but be ready and available and he's going to get an opportunity you know to, to play and contribute uh, probably more than I would have anticipated you know and then uh, Gavin Dugas obviously uh, you guys are familiar with him has had some really good moments here and has power and hitting skill does a great job with the routine play has arm strength to turn the double play so we've Moved him in there. Uh, he has not been healthy. He's had an eye procedure, you know, in November that, um, you know, we had him, you know, do to, to help him out. And they actually found something that he needed to get corrected, not just for baseball standpoint, but a life standpoint. And so we've been kind of rehabbing that. So he's a little behind just in terms of reps uh, right now in terms of this year. Uh, my hope is that he'll be good to go competing in scrimmages by next weekend. Um, fielded ground balls yesterday, 
and uh, plan on doing the same today. So what's great about it is, you know, there's all these other players on the team where that's not going to, there's not going to be a, a, there's not a starter at second base. These guys aren't gunning to be the second baseman. Like all of them can help us win. All of them are going to have opportunities in different ways to help us win. Hey, Coach, I've, I've heard you talk about Skeens and reference him. You think he can be the best pitcher in the country. Um, is he a Friday night guy right off the bat for you? And maybe, maybe you can mention maybe a couple other guys that you've added in terms of pitching that you think can round out that rotation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the answer is yes, 1,000% yes. Um, if, I did, if I didn't answer it, yes, I don't know that I'm fit to do the job. Um, man, it's a it's a – Elite fastball. Uh, we had a very intentional plan when we recruited him of like, this is what we're going to do. We wanted him to get to work right away on some other things with Wes. And for seven weeks at the beginning of school, it was really laid out to elevate the things he needed to do to be that type of pitcher, to be one of the best pitchers in the country and you know, a future major league starter. That's where his life is going, in my opinion. And so we attacked that. So we shortened his fall a little bit. We had him only throw five times to stop him two weeks early to get that extra recovery time because he went from starting pitcher at Team USA, that critical development time. We wanted him to pitch, you know, competitively. And though, so we gave him a little more time on the back to get ramped up. And um, it's the talent, it's easy to see. The person is elite. It, 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 he's a, an outlier, you know, from a competitor, from a teammate. He's a leader on this team, like right now. There was no feeling that out commands the respect of his teammates and it's a guy that is in going to be in those situations because you know how everybody's going to play behind him because of the respect that they have for him so there's um he's he's the real deal i mean a player person the whole thing uh other new pitchers um as a question thatcher heard transfer from ucla uh incredible talent um ability to manipulate the baseball throw strikes bulldog competitor uh, I think you'll be really excited about uh, him being on the mound. Uh, Chase Shores, a uh, freshman that is uh, supremely talented, um, really high-end fastball. And again, you, you look at the, the physical skills at 6'8", it's arm speed, but the, the poise, the uh, competitiveness, the readiness to, to make a contribution in, in you know, the burning building that is the SEC. Like he's, he's, he's right there and uh, in a really good spot. Uh, Christian Little, obviously from Vanderbilt, um, you know, had an uh, injury during the summertime that we had to get taken care of and cleaned up, kind of delayed his progress in the fall a little bit, allowed us to take a step back and, and say, what are we looking at now, has come back in a really, really good spot. I mean, throwing the ball incredibly well, uh, four pitches for strikes. Um, and then there's a couple freshmen, and I, I'm hesitant to continue because I don't want to leave anybody out because – you know, there's, there's a lot of really talented arms. Uh, Aiden Moffitt, uh, I mean, incredible fastball, um, incredible future, and is, is making great strides on an outing-by-outing basis. Griffin Herring is a left-hander that we really like a lot. And then Nate Ackenhausen, uh, left-hander transfer, who's been highly successful in junior college, has a lot of competitive character that we're going to be able to, to use. So um, adding – those guys, and if I'm leaving somebody out, it's certainly not intentional, but uh, we certainly wanted to upgrade, uh, give ourselves a chance to have starting pitchers pitch deeper in the game. Very proud of the pitching staff last year, um, you know, as a whole, but it, it, was, it was tough to navigate sometimes. Um, you know, in terms of starting pitcher effectiveness, we have a way to measure it, and I think we were 11th in our, our metrics in the SEC from the starting pitchers. And uh, so to finish in fourth place where you're 11th, Pretty good accomplishment, and uh, I don't want to get into the weeds and explain how we get to that number, but um, it's pretty deliberate. And now I think you know the bullpen was strong last year. I think you're going to have that, maybe even a little better, and then a, an upgrade on the starting pitcher side of it. Coach, you have a couple of players now on your roster that have come in from junior college programs, um, and they've made it very apparent that they're going to have a very positive impact on this team. Um, are there any kind of qualities, not just on the field, but just as people, just human um, baseline that they have that maybe you can attribute to that JUCO experience that your other guys maybe don't have? 
Great question, uh, and happy to answer that. I think uh, it doesn't matter whether it's freshman, junior college transfer, now transfer portal, every decision in recruiting is made on what's best for LSU baseball. But I think you bring something to light there is um, those guys at some point were told they weren't good enough to be at this level at the start. And so sometimes that fuels motivation, desire, competitiveness to really get after it and really work. And that's always a valuable quality in a person that you have. And then those are very humble beginnings. They don't have this. I mean, like it's not what their life looks like. Um, I called one of our recruits as pitching today. Uh, one of the guys that we signed, it's his first start. Just wished him good luck. And uh, they, they were in a small van, you know, going where they were going to play. Um, and so I think some humility that comes along with being at that level, work ethic. I mean, at a place like this, you're going to be able to attract talent, but it's some of those other characteristics that when you talk about building a team and building a program are really positive. And so there's an element of that that I, I really like recruiting here. Coach, last year in the regionals, was that a eye-opener to you, a little bit of a barometer as to how far you had to go and how much evaluation did you do off of those handful of games, or was it a season-long thing? Yeah, I think in the, the moment, not thinking about anything, but how do we get 27 outs with us scoring the more runs than they do? And uh, how can we set it up and execute it? And, and as I mentioned, very proud of, of how we, we pitched with what we had in, in a non-dogmatic approach where you don't have guys going deep into the game. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to – I look at where we want to be. And, uh, you know, having the benefit of coming here from a College World Series team in 21 – and you're facing Kumar Rocker, who's arguably one of the best pitchers in SEC history and college baseball history, and they're the national champion and the national runner-up. Well, so to do that, you you got to find a way to get guys that are, are that elite, future major league pitchers. I think there's certainly exceptions to the rule, but teams that make it to Omaha and have a chance to compete for a national title have future major leaguers on their roster. You will not – win at a high level in the SEC if you do not have that. And um, so we're always going to be trying to, to upgrade the talent. I would say it was just uh, enlightening. I would say going through 10 straight weeks and then the, going to Hoover for the SEC tournament and then Southern Miss's pitching staff was elite. Like they were an SEC pitching staff. Like kind of going through it in that regard maybe elevated the importance of that. I've, I've used this example before. It's like the offensive line in football. If you don't have an offensive line, you're going to get crushed. If you don't have elite starting pitching, there's just going to be a ceiling. And I thought the team reached the ceiling in regards to that, which um, is a credit to them. Yeah, Jay, have a, uh, you're unanimous number one for your season by everybody, pretty class number one. Have you ever had a team with this much expectations, and how do you handle that? Do you embrace it? I mean – uh, do you lean on your leaders? How do you how do you approach that? Yeah, good question. I think I uh, have two answers to it. I, I, the expectations from me to them are very clear in terms of core values, in terms of what this team needs to do to be successful. And if I were to simplify it, and I think I already said it, to prepare at the highest possible level and then to give everything they have towards executing what their job is for the team to win. That's – that's how you deal with that. And then, so let's talk about the other part of it. It's like you're a firefighter and the house is burning down. Kind of a similar analogy to going through the SEC schedule. Like if you tiptoe around it, you hesitate, you're going to get trucked. Because I think there's like 10 teams ranked or something like that. So you run right into the building, you get the hose out, you start pulling everybody out and make sure everybody's safe. So that's that's how we're going to approach it. It's awesome. I think it's I think it's great. You can... Utilize it for recruiting. I mean, young people want to go to places that care about baseball and where they have a chance to be successful. We have that here. And, and so it helps you in that regard. In terms of the play, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But, I mean, if I tried to come out here and undersell, like, that this team should have high expectations, that would be dumb. Like, uh, we're, not, we're running to the building, we're going to get the hose out, and we're going to start pulling people out of there and go for it. Three young players, 
Brady at behind the plate, Paxton, and then Jared Jones. How do you not – they could compete for starting spots. How do you not try to put too much pressure on them immediately? And then specifically with Jared, the move from catching his entire prep career to DH or first base, how has that gone so far? Yeah, I think uh, developing mindset. I've said it a couple times already. You're always working on that. Those three guys, everyone you mentioned, all three of them could play in the major league someday. From just a pure talent standpoint, the biggest jump they'll make in their baseball career in terms of what's diff the biggest difference between where they were and where they are now is right now. And so their ability to just slow down and manage themselves and get focused on the task at hand or have the ability uh, to recover when they get kicked in the teeth, because they're going to get kicked in the teeth, no matter how good they are. The SEC, the, the schedule we play, it's just going to do that. Uh, that's where we have to coach them to success on. And uh, I've already seen great strides, and there's going to be more. I think the benefit you have here is you have, like, two groups of, of players, you know, super young, super talented, old, experienced, you know, been through both highs and lows, and, and, and you can use all of that to your benefit and to those guys' benefit. But they're going to play, and um, I'll just get this out of the way like right now. is like the question at the end of the season, one of them is going to be, how do you replace Dylan Cruz? You don't do it with one player. You do it with Gavin Guidry, Brady Neal, Jared Jones, Paxton Klang, Tommy White, Josh Pearson. That's a pretty good start to that. And so uh, super pumped about, about where those guys can go. Coach, could you comment on the catching position? Yeah, um, great day yesterday. We played a three-inning scrimmage. Um, and uh, yesterday, uh, Alex Malazzo and, and Brady Neal were exceptional uh, behind the plate. Um, I think they are, are ready to go from a defensive standpoint. Uh, Alex has made tremendous strides uh, offensively. It was happening last year, and then he got hurt. You know what I mean? And, and, and production means a heck of a lot more to me than just batting average at that position, especially – in the context of this team. So really happy with him. He's also done a terrific job because you have three players. And I should have mentioned Ethan Frey, actually, in, in that grouping of players, too. So you have Ethan Frey, Brady Neal, Jared Jones. Those guys, this is all new. And so Alex is like, jumped to the front of this thing. And Coach Jordan's doing a great job developing that position. Like, man, I couldn't be more excited about um, how that's going. And, and Alex deserves some credit for that. Um, Hayden Travinsky, uh, much like his entire career, he's kind of struggled through some injury things, you know, with his knees and hamstrings and availability to play. He has, I mean, light tower power. And, um, you know, showing up with a really good attitude today. Much like second base, you know, having depth of four or five guys there, you know, there's a lot that we can do with that. I think how we structure the pitching staff, the dynamic of the team, uh, the importance of defense with the lead, uh, there's gonna, it's going to be fun to watch that evolve, and um, you know, I, I feel, feel good about it. And, and they all have to get better in their own way, but I uh, feel like we're in a good spot, really good spot. Uh, Coach, recent history, in not only in this program, but around the conference and, and the nation, um, talks about arms, you know, and, and the, um, the, how fragile pitchers are. How do you handle that going into a, a season like this where you obviously going to need all hands on deck? You just have to be deliberate in your plan with everything. I mean, literally with everything. Strength and conditioning, nutrition, a 12-month calendar of when they're building, when they're a little lower mode, and when they're developing, and then building that into the season to put everybody in a good spot, not just for the beginning, but for the duration of that. And I think uh, – you know, if I learned something last year, it was just the, the pitching depth thing is so important because, I mean, man, if you think about Riley Cooper, <laughs> uh, Gervais, Reiselman, like, and thinking of the leverage that those guys' situations that they kept coming in and coming in and coming in, I mean, we asked a lot out of those guys, and they did awesome. And then at the end, maybe they were just a little bit more normal, you know, so to speak. I think having guys like um, Sam Dutton, you know, who can come in and really give you a good outing um, at any time. Blake Money, you know, and, and th both those guys have really improved. 
those freshman pitchers that I talked about in terms of Shores, Moffitt, Herring, and then you got the improvement of Ty Floyd and Grant Taylor. Um, you know, I think that is adding Paul Skeen, Stature Heard, Christian Little, I just gave you four different groupings of guys that we feel like can go out and get out right now. And that's, uh, that's exciting and hopefully will allow us I don't want to say it at pace because you can't do that in the SEC, but more guys can make a positive contribution than everybody is better throughout the year because of it. Coach, with all the hype, not just for you guys, more specifically with Dylan Cruz, I think he's everybody around the country's foregone conclusion to be the top overall pick this summer. Is he, though, the best guy that's best equipped to handle all of that hype this year? He's so equipped, like I haven't even thought about that. Um, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, we have talked about this, is having players that have been through it before, um, Chris Bryant, you know, Jacob Berry, um, Austin Wells at, at Arizona. Like, you know, the key is for the player just to be themselves. The reason he's thought of is because he's friggin' awesome. As a player, as a person, I mean, 10 out of 10 isn't a, doesn't do him justice. So you can have one conversation with him and just like, hey, here's the baseball stuff. We're going to continue to work on. This is what makes you special. Your job is to be yourself. And then it's my job to help him if I see him ever get outside of that himself, get him back to being himself. But I've never – I don't think about it very much because I have so much confidence in him. And it's easy to see because he's so on it. Like I know what on it looks like <laughs> with him. And so if it's ever off track – and there's nobody better at, hey, let's go spend 20 minutes in the cage. And, and it's more of this than anything else. And then he's going to hit a 450-foot home run to right field. You know, um, pretty awesome. And, um, yeah, who has the number one pick? I don't even I, – I know they did that lottery thing. Pirates? All right. Don't think too hard. Jay, not to, um, not to crit criticize la last year's team, but – in terms of what you like to do offensively and what you like to do pitching, maybe even on defense, how much, how much more of the playbook, if it, if it can use a football analogy, can you will you be able to use this year that maybe you couldn't quite do last year? I think probably to be determined. I think there's more guys that maybe are balanced in terms of speed, power, solid hitting skills, uh, defensive aptitude. Improvement, you know, some guys from last year's team, you're, I'm, I'm excited for you to see and go like, whoa, that's not the guy that I saw last year. Uh, I've had a lot of success with player development from year one to year two, whether it's freshman to sophomore, first year in a program to second year in a program. I think that will take shape uh, in terms of style and things we will do. It's going to come down to what's required of the team or the offense or the defense that night to win. And then we'll play to that with talented players. And so I'm not avoiding the question at all. It's just like that's uh, that's kind of how I see it. Um, you know, I don't like talking about the past a whole lot, but kind of a, as an offensive coach who loves offense and, and hitting and scoring runs and being creative and all those types of things, you know, the two Omaha trips, one we led the country in sacrifice bunts, and the other was one of the best offenses in – Pac-12 history in terms of slugging and on base and OPS and all those types of things. So you look at last year's team, Dylan Cruz, the chance to be the you know, first college player taken. Jacob Berry was the first college player taken. Uh, Kate Doty, it's just like you have to be smart about some of the things you do and giving up outs and, and how you structure things. And the ballparks that we play in are really small, like here. Like that's a big – that's a, if you want to talk about an adjustment. So – you just have to be smart about how you how you roll all that stuff out. Um, always love looking at it, and and really how we approach it. And maybe this is a better way to answer the question: is any type of game, slugfest, one run game, any type of park, small, big, any type of you know, the day game, night game, wind blowing in, wind blowing out. We have to have a skill set to match that. Um, you know, winning in Omaha is a little different than winning in parks in the SEC. So we don't ever want to get caught off guard with those types of things and. Uh, it's a long-winded answer, but it's something I, I could talk about all day long because I, I think uh, I'm excited about what guys will be able to do, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll use things appropriately or at the right time. Both Cade Beloso and Gavin Dugas made the choice to return this year. What do you view their roles as on the team? Yeah, uh, leaders first and foremost. You know, I mentioned um, 
getting the right guys on the bus. Uh, those two guys are from Louisiana. Uh, being a part of this program means something to them. And so uh, I think when you look at Cade, you know, really tough deal. And we missed him last year. Like, we had a great offense, but we missed his contribution of the player that he was becoming. Uh, his, is, his role is going to be to take a really quality at bat, you know, whether that's in the starting lineup in a pinch hit role, uh, to A, get on base, and to B, move the ball forward with runners on base. And so uh, very confident in his ability to do that. Now, I haven't seen it in game play because he missed the season last year. But all of last fall, all of leading into the season, all of this fall, and kind of still doing it on one leg and probably leading into the season, uh, high marks for him. You know, in terms of Gavin, I think we all know what Gavin's capable of doing. Uh, at least since I've been here, like, we just have had a tough run of injuries, whether it was hand, wrist, uh, eye. And, um, you know, big credit to him to continue to persevere. And, like, when I think about those guys – and I'm thinking about what do we need to do today, there'll be no hesitation in putting them in key spots to help us win when that's what the game needs that day. And so very appreciative to those guys. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's cool they're here and, and it's still a part of this thing. I think Cade Beloso put off getting married to come back. So that's a, yeah. Might have to high five his fiance for that one. Hey, Coach, uh, last year you had Eric Grisselman and Paul Gervais close out games way for you. Who do you expect to take over that role this year? Wow. Um, not prepared to answer that just yet in a good way because there's guys that can do it. Um, you know, I don't think I mentioned him earlier. Uh, Bryce Collins has made a massive jump forward, um, massive. And um, I think, you know, not to say that he won't start or – being in different situations, um, looks great. Christian Little mentioned Chase Shores. Uh, you know, one, one of our best guys is going to come out of the pen. It's always the way I've operated my teams. And so, you know, I would say probably not Paul Skeens, um, but literally if it was Thatcher, her, Ty Floyd, Grant Taylor, um, and any of those guys I just mentioned, Aiden Moffitt eventually is going to be good enough to do that at a really, really high level. It'll just be a timing thing. Nate Ackenhausen, Riley Cooper, um, from the, both from the left side. I mean, those guys pitch with – they pitch above their tools because of the competitor that they are, the strikes that they throw, their ability to change speeds. So uh, excited. The next 18 days, like, we'll start looking at that. And then, obviously, it'll probably change throughout the year. There's just – it's nice to have options. At third base, I assume Tommy White's going to be the starter, but how is he sort of looked defensively? And um, and if someone could come in there on a pinch at third, who, who are you looking at? Yeah, um, he's been great defensively. If uh, you were here yesterday, you saw three – it was only three inning scrimmage, but you saw three real high-level plays made by him. And uh, it's amazing when you get a talented person that's highly motivated to do something and then is intentional about how they do it, what they can accomplish – and uh, really pleased with where he's at right now. I mean, really, really pleased. Um, if we had to do something else, and that'll happen at some point. Um, ben Napolt, you know, played there on a team that played in a regional final, I believe, um, and was an all-conference player at Virginia Commonwealth at third base. So uh, him or Jack Merrifield would probably, or Gavin Dugas, uh, those three would probably be the, the next in line. And then if we were making some kind of shift, you know, I don't want to make anybody's head explode, but move Trey to the outfield. Um, you know, if we did something like that and rolled it around, which I haven't really thought of yet, like that's not a, a thing we're intending on doing, but if, you know, it was injury or something like that, I think you might see third base be used very much like second base. Uh, Coach, with all the additions that you've made to the pitching staff, can you maybe now ask guys to do a a little less, like, you know, money, Helmers, Dutton, maybe, hey, go give us a, an inning or two and kind of. Absolutely. And I think I'm kind of excited about that because where you get in trouble, at least in my career with pitching, is asking pitchers to do more than they probably should or they're capable of in, in, in executing something that maybe is not in their skill set. But when you have more guys, you can slot them and put them in a lane and then they can really go for it. And those guys that you just mentioned will all benefit from that.
Coach, uh, can you talk about uh, the start of the SEC? Uh, when are you going to have all the roles established? You open up at A&M and then Tennessee and Arkansas. Generally, you want to have all your, your roles established before the SEC. Secondly, who is going to coach third base? And thirdly, your uh, defensive percentage, uh, fielding percentage this year. How much have you worked on that this offseason? Okay. That's three questions, so I might have to ask you to repeat them. Um, the one I got for sure is Josh Jordan will coach third base. Um, I mean, he's replacing Dan Fitzgerald as a recruiting coordinator. We shifted how we're doing some of the instruction things. He coaches the catchers. Uh, we'll coach third base. Uh, I'm coaching the infielders, meaning the second baseman, shortstops, and third baseman. Um, he's coaching the first baseman also. So uh, he will coach uh, third base in terms of defensive fielding percentage. I, I don't know. I want to – whatever the, the top record is, so we'll just call it 1,000. That's, that's my goal um, one day at a time. You know, you, you want to – and I always point it out to the team. When there's a zero in the air column, that's one of the first things in the postgame speech that, that goes up there. Um, you know, not looking back. Tommy's worked really hard. Jordan has worked really hard and is healthy. Um, there's several guys that can contribute at second base. Um, so feel good about that. Feel great about the catching as we talked about. Um, so feel really good about it. So I think I got two of the three. What was the third one? Oh, rolls. Okay. Yeah, I think there's no like – where you have to do it, there's certainly some benefit in doing that. I think we'll be able to uh, line it up a number of different ways throughout the year that will allow us to be successful. And we'll spend a lot of time as a coaching staff at looking at each day and each player and put them in a good position to be successful. And if it works out that way, awesome. You know, like that's great. And, and there's some benefits to that. It gives players some peace of mind, but you can also give uh, players' peace of mind by communicating them and then coaching at all of them. And I think that's the strength of our coaching staff, and I think our players would tell you that. Th the 38 guys on the roster, on the active roster for this year, all 38 guys get communi communicated to and coached. Just coach in the back. Uh, injury update, anybody not available three weeks from now or long term? Yeah, um, Caleb Appleby came in with an existing uh, deal. He will not pitch. Uh, Jaden Newt came in with an existing deal, which we tried to give some time. He will not pitch this year. And um, Jason Bowman um, had an injury last year and gave it a, a great effort to try to come back. He won't, he won't play this year. So that's, that's where that, all that stands right now. Where's Javen at? Great question and happy to talk about that. Um, he's uh, progressing tremendously well. Um, you know, that was a big blow to last year's team, you know, when he went down. I would have liked to have seen the season play out with him staying healthy. Uh, he was operated on um, by Dr. Keith Meister, who's – there's there's two guys that are, are the guys as far as Tommy John. So very thankful to LSU and being at a program that allows you to send your players to one of the best in the country to get that surgery. As such um, – Maybe you'll see him play catch out there today, and it looks pretty good. So we don't have to make a decision on whether he's in or not in until uh, a few weeks from now. But my hope is if there's, if there's a window, we're going to go for it, you know. Um, and uh, we'll do what's right, you know, by him. And um, got a great surgery. He's been phenomenal at his rehab. Deserves a lot of credit for that. And uh, really positive development that I'll be honest, I was very skeptical about just in, you know, pitcher injury history of what I've seen and how, what it takes guys to come back. And he's on his way, which is awesome. He's just playing catch. I think we're out to, we're out to 90, uh, about ready to accelerate to 110, 120. Uh, then you move into like uh, what's called, we call a short bullpen or short box bullpen, touch and field type bullpen, then to the mound. And, um, you know, I think three weeks from now we'll have a lot better idea on whether he's going to be a go and um, certainly hope that he is. And, uh, you know, you can't have enough pitching, can't have enough left-handed pitching. All right.